Hello, all you rascally drywallers out there. I hope you're having a fun-filled day today. I'm excited for this one. You are going to be in store for a patriotic episode of the Drywall Podcast. I am Nick Harmon, your host. With us today, Walter Baker with American Acoustics out of Reno, Nevada. Walter is a 63-year-old veteran of drywall with a special spot for texture. His knowledge of the trade runs deep in experience and in business. At one time, he surpassed 90 employees, but it wasn't always easy. We talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly drywall has to offer and how he cut his teeth with an unlikely instructor. So I went to work for them, and they were all two guys, of course, and um, there was 146 units there, and the guy hired me just to run the gun uh, for 15 bucks a roll. I'll never forget it, 500-foot roll. And I didn't know shit. I mean, I, I knew the basics, but I fought that thing and fought that thing and fought that thing. But I told myself, you know, by the time these 140 units are done, I'm going to yeah. know how to run this damn gun. Yeah. And I actually took a, you know, pretty much cut and pay just to learn. Oh, yeah. And I'll never forget, you know, it's kind of one of them turning points in life when you hit these certain little plateaus. And I'll never forget this guy from California that was on the job. And he goes, man, he goes, you'll fight that thing for three months. He goes, then one <clears> day it'll just all click and you'll never forget it. We talk a lot about the tools. We talk about his time in Oklahoma, knowing the boys over at Freeman Drywall Products, the tapeworm, and just a lot about automatic tools. I've known Walter through Fresco Harmony for a long time, and I'm excited for you to get to know him as well. The Drywall Podcast was brought to you today by Fresco Harmony, making walls better since 2004. It's hard to believe it's been 20 years. We sell product at CSR and yours truly is going to be there June 6th and 7th at the Barry and Concord locations. Uh, I look forward to seeing you guys. We're going to be there all day having fun. It's your man Cam might be there. Brawley's dad construction. And we're going to play in the mud and have a ball. Have a hankering for learning Fresco Harmony, but don't have the time or money to go up to Canada for this next training. You can receive a free sample pack if you reach out to me at info at frescoharmony.com, uh, we'll hook you up. You can also get a free sample pack if you are in Canada through CSR. You can reach out to me for that as well. But for now, Walter Baker on the 94th episode of the Drywall Podcast. Let's get into it. We've got Walter Baker out of Reno, Nevada. Yeah, that's right. And uh, acoustics, American acoustics. Uh huh. And Walter, we're gonna get into it, but I've known you for a little while. For a little while, when your name pops up, it reminds me of a children's book that I have for my son. And the main character is Walter Baker, and he bakes <laughs> he bakes uh, pretzels. <laughs> you know, that's funny. Uh, my grandkids uh, always used to kid me about the book, Walter the Farting Dog. <laughs> ah, okay. All right. So hello and welcome to a children's book episode of the Drywall Park. There we go. There we go. I was actually, you know what I was actually going to say is a patriotic uh, episode of the Drywall Podcast because Walter was kind enough to give me a couple of shirts uh and you've got pink and yellow here to show just for our friends cool. and they're very patriotic you got american right. six you got the flag uh this which i looked up uh has to do with living free 
correct? Sure. So, liber viv ut morer, yeah? I'm not sure it's Latin. <laughs> okay. And then we got, to, and then we have the Statue of Liberty, of course. And uh, yeah, we the people. Very cool. Very cool. Um, and what, wait, what's the here's Johnny? Okay. So I get the, I get the shining reference there. What does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean to you? Well, I used to have a, <clears throat> a pretty good sized company back in the 2000s here in Reno. Okay. And uh, we hit some hard times because the uh, recession came in, whatever. And uh, I was on a couple of jobs where I kind of got hosed a little bit. So anyway, I used to do Jip Creek floors also. Um, I was a hacker applicator here in Reno. We just kind of packed up and uh, I went to Oklahoma for three years, uh, 2010. Okay. Just just to do Jip Creek floors basically and, and let everything kind of blow over here. And uh, when I came back, um, none of my previous competitors ever thought I would, you know, do much of much. So sure. the, the here's Johnny is kind of referring to that. And here's Johnny. <laughs> here's Johnny. Um, yeah, but your name's Walter. What it could have said, here's Walter. Well, you're just you like know, the, the here's johnny is kind of the thing you know classic johnny carson and you know yeah, that's true back. now wait is your reference to johnny carson or is your reference to the shiny me basically using him <laughs> as no, I'm, I'm saying which one jack or uh or Johnny. Oh, the, the shining one, definitely, where he sticks his head around the door, yeah. you know? Okay. All right. That's what I was, <laughs> that's what I was, yeah. You know what? I just recently watched that again with my friend, Anne Marie. She had said she had never seen it all the way through. Disturbing. If you're younger and you've never seen the original Shining from 1970, Stanley Kubrick, it's a phenomenal horror film, Uh, probably one of the best. And also, if you're younger... Here's Johnny is a reference from Johnny Carson, the original late night show with Johnny Carson. Uh, mm -hmm. He was, he was there for years, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think he, I remember Johnny Carson. Like that's how, that's how old I am. Yeah. <laughs> and how young are we here, uh, Walter? How young? I'm 63. 63 years young. A veteran in the trade now. Okay, let's get back to the shirt. Are you like? Are you a veteran? Are you a war veteran in the United no. States? What What's with the uh, patriotism displayed on the shirt? Just out of curiosity. Well, I'm kind of a patriotic type guy. You know, I right. love my country. Okay. And, uh, yep. You see a lot of disturbing things going on and. Um, they've always been there, obviously, but they're getting yeah. blatant anymore. But, yes. Um, it's, it's getting louder. Yeah. The, the energy on both sides. Like, you know, I get what you're saying. So, you know, I've got the name American Acoustics, uh, and I think that's kind of pretty patriotic. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I do appreciate the Declaration of Independence. There is a couple of shows pertaining to the history of the United States. One is called The History of Us. Fantastic documentary on the History Channel. The History of Us U.S. And it takes okay. you all the way from the landing of the Mayflower to the building of the railroads and how the United States uh, sprawled across the country back in the day, the invention of the barbed wire, uh, uh, and also the Declaration of Independence, That how important that was. Also... There's a, a show that my mom just referenced that I've seen in its entirety called John Adams. And okay. it's uh, played by Paul Giamatti. And uh, uh, it's a fantastic story of John Adams and the, and the inception of the United States, which is a, it's a pretty fantastic story. <laughs> All of that. That's what I think of when I see We the People anywhere and on the back of your shirt. You know, what's funny is when the Puritans came to America for freedom of religion, it was all kind of cool as long as you were a Puritan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, 
but they, it was i think the the origin of the country too uh, i saw something recently on a, you know a speech by donald trump i don't want to get into politics for sure and a speech by lincoln and how far even departed we are today from where we came from both parties like how how detached we are from our original uh founding fathers you know yeah. inception of what this country could be yeah. that's always the place where i come from you know oh yeah absolutely but uh uh we don't want to bore our listeners we want for no. this to be an exciting entertaining show <laughs> <laughs> about walter baker and his uh his journey uh in drywall you are you first generation drywaller i am okay when did you get your start i started uh in lincoln nebraska um i was about 15 years old okay i had quit school because in the well not for everybody but in the 70s you know people um, quit school a lot more than they do now i did i did get my ged later on sure um i had my first child when i was 18 oh wow um, so i had to find something besides you know flipping burgers at mcdonald's to make money were you married had, were you married then um i was living with my first wife in lincoln Nebraska. okay we weren't married but um i kind of got into it by accident actually a friend of mine okay um came walking up the street one day in lincoln and he says hey he goes uh, uh i'm working for this drywall company and they're hiring and in lincoln nebraska is a college town obviously and uh um uh, they cater to the college kids you know to help pay off their bills and stuff so there's a lot of part-time people okay so i went in there and they go yeah we'll hire you so I'm like, okay, cool. So they put me on the spray crew right off the bat. And they had this humongous truck mount 750 peat whip back in the day, you know. Yeah. Full of popcorn, you know, back in the day. And Beautiful. I think I was in about a week and I told those guys, I'll, I'll never forget it. I said, you know, guys, I will never, I'm only here for a small time till I find something else. This is bullshit work, you know. And here I am, you know, 46, 47 years later still doing it. So. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> we it's it's conceivable that many of us out there had that same conversation in the first few months of oh, working yeah. working drywall. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like what what am I doing? This is it. What yeah. am I doing with my life? Spraying. I remember spraying off the tools out in the cold rain, you know, Portland, Oregon, carrying oh, scaffold. God, yeah. I was like, this sucks. <laughs> oh yeah, you know, it's just like how could anybody do this for a living, you know? And these guys yeah. all laughing at me, you know. And yeah. Yeah. These old timers, you know. <laughs> so that's yeah. how I got my start uh, about six months in there at Lincoln, Nebraska. Okay. All right. Uh, very cool. And you, interesting. So we have you to thank for some of that spray popcorn bullshit that we're all yeah. now, that we all get to cover. So we jobs, job security. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Shout out. Morning. Shout out to the inventor of popcorn. Just keeping the ball, keeping the ball rolling. Uh, you know, there's there's a when go, when God closes a door, he opens a window. That's right. <laughs> or hands you a floor scraper. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Uh, okay, cool. So you start out at 15. You're working in the trade. You're in Nebraska at that time. Yeah. Yes. Where yes. do we go? Where do we go from here? Well, um, my first wife, we kind of had split up and she went down to Tulsa, Oklahoma, where okay. her parents lived. Her father was a pathologist. And uh, <clears throat> so I went down there to visit one weekend and we kind of got back together anyway. So I didn't really want to move down to Tulsa, but I didn't really have a job in Lincoln at that time. And uh, I made the mistake of telling her, I says, well, you know, uh, back in those days, you just had the Sunday paper, you know? Yeah. So I told her, I go, well, you know, if I could find a job in the Sunday paper, you know, at doing drywall, you know, I'll move down here and I'll be damned if there wasn't four ads in the Sunday paper. Oh, I'm sure. Papers, you know? So I started out in Nebraska. I was like at 350 an hour back in the late seventies. Beautiful. 
And um, I get down there to Tulsa, and the guy goes, uh, he goes, well, we'll give you four seventy five an hour. And man, I just thought I was in hog heaven four seventy five an hour, you know. And, and because so, you were already knowledgeable about the trade, and you had some chops. I only had like six months in. I was still an apprentice. Okay. But uh, I worked for that company for about eight, nine years there in Tulsa. Um, and they were actually called American Acoustics. That's where I got the name. They were called American. You stole yes. their name. Beautiful. They're no longer in business. They went out in the, in the <laughs> mid-80s. But fun the, the, fact, fun fact about Tulsa, Oklahoma. I'm not sure you're familiar with Broken Arrow then if you're from down there. Oh, yeah. So then I would assume that you're familiar with Freeman drywall products, correct? I know those guys personally, actually. Yeah. Uh, Freeman, Freeman got their start. They bought out the Kelly Moore plant there in, in Broken Arrow. Okay. And um, Freeman's actually was the only place. It's kind of weird, too, because Tulsa is a lot of hand tapers, a lot of banjo guys, a lot of hand finishers. But there's yeah. also quite a, quite a few um, tool guys. Yeah. Because he, sell, he sells the tools. Freeman sells the tools. Freeman uh, was one of the first to stock any part for any tool. I mean, you could walk in there, and you can't even do that in Reno, Nevada today. Sure. But in little old Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, you could walk in there and buy any part for any brand at any time. Right. In fact, I've got a Freeman T-shirt. I'm the only one in probably Reno, Nevada that has one because I last time I ordered some parts from them, I told them to throw me in a T-shirt. That's <laughs> it's funny. Just a trophy, you know. Well, I raz I raz the acoustical ceilings because uh, Dwayne Freeman's dad supposedly invented the popcorn ceilings. I don't know. Oh if my you, god! I don't know if you knew that, or he came out with the first non-asbestos brand of popcorn ceilings i've heard i've heard a lot of rumors that he used to uh be in with hamilton's in la um here on the west coast hamilton's is real big and then he yeah he bought out the kelly moore mud line there they used to make paco mud because we used to use it okay uh, paco -P was a kelly moore brand i don't think i've ever heard of that and that goes way back but uh, yeah, I've, I I I love Freeman's products of of any kind. I've used his mud, and it's really good. It's creamy. It I liked it. It just wasn't uh, for Fresco. I wanted the USG because it was more predominant, you know. Yes. And uh -huh. that and that specifically pertaining to color, you can get USG in Reno. Show a client a color chart and be and be assured that you're going to get a consistent color you know, yeah. up there as well. But uh, yeah. I used Freeman's mud when uh, back in the day, they were very interested in fresco harmony for one second. Uh, <laughs> and there, there, there almost could have been something, but uh, uh, Freeman, he's, it was a little, maybe it was just a little bit outside of the comfort yeah. zone. Yeah. They were also a spray force dealer in the Midwest for the big spray rigs and they had all the parts, you know? Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm real familiar with Freeman's. Interesting. Interesting. So back to the story, you head down to Tulsa with who is now your ex-wife, I assume yes. your first wife. How many times have we been married here? I'm on my third. Okay. All right. So this is the last one, right? We're done. This is it. Yeah. We're done. This she's, is it. she's the keeper. The and keeper. who who is who is that? Uh, her name is Renee Baker. Renee and Baker. And how long have you and Renee been together? Well, we've been together since two thousand seven. Two thousand seven. That's not bad. That's not yeah. bad. It's yeah. not good for you. And you and it's going good. Everything's good. Oh yeah. Yeah, everything's good. fine. Good. Yeah. Okay. Uh Tulsa. What do you think well, of Tulsa? You like it down there? I like the Oklahoma type people. Maybe not in the yeah. cities like like Oklahoma yeah. City or Tulsa, but in the in the smaller towns, they'll do <clears> anything <throat> for you. Yeah. Um when we went back there in 2010, we picked up an A-frame house on 10 acres uh from Wells Fargo uh for 31,000 bucks. Wow. And yeah, it was just like and I would have loved to stay there if you if you could make money from somewhere else, um, yeah, 
you could you could retire pretty nice there because in Oklahoma you're either filthy rich or you're filthy broke. Yeah. There's just no in between. Well, um, it's kind of you're close enough to the southwest there. It's kind of that way in Albuquerque too. You have this real yeah. real gap between, you know. Yeah. And everything's cheap here including drywall finishing. Like it's hard to eke out living here doing drywall for sure. Yeah, Oklahoma. I mean, I've got a a friend there that's got a pretty large company, Mike Trog and Drywall and and all his tapers are hand tape. I don't know how the guy makes any money. They're all hourly hand taper guy. I mean, they literally smear the mud and place the tape. It's not even a banjo, but uh, he might have he he might have went up to bazookas and stuff by now. Hopefully, <laughs> but uh, he's got a pretty good sized company. But okay, yeah, I lived there at that time for about um, ten years. Was American Acoustics using tools at that time? That oh, was yeah. early. They were, oh, yeah. yeah, they were okay. Ames tools. They were Ames. They were renting. At that time, yeah, you could you could only rent then. There was no for sale tools at that time. Yeah, this is like a uh, seventies. Yeah, still. Yes. Or are you into the eighties by now? No, it was a it was the late seventies, seventy seven, wow. seventy eight. Okay. So then uh, I got my apprenticeship there. Um, I went to work uh, with American Acoustics on Oral Roberts University Hospital which was a humongous job. We're talking uh, the hospital building is 63 stories. Um, then they have a cancer research building. It's like 30 yeah. something stories and another building that was 20 something stories, but they were all like city center in Vegas. They were like all right there together. Yeah. And um, so that's basically where I got my apprenticeship. And I had a, very good teacher. He was from Honolulu, Hawaii. We called him Five O. And I don't even know if he's still alive or not. Why do Why'd you call him Five O? That was just his nickname, Hawaii Five O. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Again, I have to explain these references to our millennial audience. Hawaii Five O, although they redid Hawaii Five O, <laughs> but the original Hawaii Five O is pretty good. Oh Book yeah, em, Book em, Dana. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, book them. Yeah, it was even like a little before my time, but I remember in the '80s they would show reruns of Hawaii Five O, and they were pretty oh. good. Yeah, yeah. So we, uh, I worked on that project for quite a few years. Well, not quite a few, but you know, four or five. And we just had miles of drywall. It was <laughs> yeah, heavy. and. I'll have to say that I was really lucky to get this kind of training because uh, Bill Lippritz, 5-0, it's his name, um, he would have us do, you know, a 10-inch box for two months straight, eight hours a day. And he would come behind you and check. And this guy would pick you for air holes. He would pick you for Christmas trees to start of the joints. He yeah. didn't want any of that. Yeah. And so that's kind of where I got my training. It was brutal. Yeah. But it paid off. You got good. You know? So that's kind of where that's at. I, I was Did you guys lucky. wipe? Did you guys wipe behind your box? No, I've seen guys do that. I've actually done that myself. It is real clean. Don't get me yeah, wrong. It works I good. Don't do it. I don't do it now. No. It requires an extra guy. Well, that, but you know, if you if you run it correctly, it'll do its job. I think so. I think these these, especially nowadays, these tools are dialed in enough that uh, you can run them pretty darn clean. The the micro adjustments on them, the blades. Ames used to send out because our closest Ames to Tulsa at the time was Dallas, Texas, and Ames used to send a care package out with all their tools. They'd have you know sets of blades. They'd have. Uh, bazooka blades they'd have you know because you know it's a week to ship it back to dallas and get a new one so the other part of your training was you also learn how to work on these tools and right if it broke down on the job you got to get it fixed within reason of course yeah so yeah. you don't see that hardly anymore either these guys are running bazooka and and they won't even know something's wrong with it or you see guys I... running box <laughs> I remember start in Sierra Vista is kind of where I started the bazooka and I was thrusted into it because my partner was running the bazooka 
And he left because he was a lazy ass. And I was like, I'm just going to finish these houses myself. By that time, I was like, the only thing I don't know is a bazooka. I'm just going to learn this damn thing. And yeah, of course, I was running the crappy truck. Like they let me take the crappy like two wheel drive, like the little Toyota with the rack on it, you know, with all the tools thrown in the back. I got to drive that truck and, um, you know, manual transmission, <laughs> just a, ju- just a beater. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, of course I got the crappiest tools. So this bazooka, I, you know, it was, which was a good thing. Cause I had to learn how to fix it constantly. You know, I was always complaining, but, uh, it's, I think that's a good, that's a good thing. Now these bazookas nowadays are just, have you ran like a carbon fiber brand new predator? Holy shit. It's just like, <laughs> no, I've got a Columbia and a tape Smooth. myself. Yeah. Smooth. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty crazy. Yeah. Speaking of bazookas, I actually owned my own bazooka in Tulsa because okay. there you either have the tools yourself or I mean, nobody's going to provide them when you're doing piece work. You know, I worked hourly for American Acoustics for about six, eight years, and then I uh, went piece work. And so you got to have your own tools. And I had this old tapeworm gun. Yeah, but you you couldn't get your own tools at that time, right? You had to rent or nothing, I thought. Well, when they came out in 81, tapeworm was the first ones out. Right, the tapeworm. We've yeah, that's got, that's come up. That was by was that by Mirko, I want to say, those dudes. They are now. Mirko's actually a brand of mud down in Texas. Right, but they do the tapeworm. Yeah, they do. I don't know um if they did originally, they might have bought it out. Okay. In fact, speaking about that, uh the Freeman boys bought out the blue line. They actually own blue yes. line. I was going to talk about that a little bit, but nope. we skipped we skipped <laughs> over it. No, we I mean we skipped over it, but let, let's stay on the the tapeworm cuz there's a guy that I interviewed G4 mm-hmm. up north who sells tapeworm. Mm-hmm. And nobody else really sells it. It's a pretty rare tool. They uh, they were the first to come out from day one. They had a pop off back on their bazooka, uh, which is a like a like a heavy duty fiber plastic whatever. Okay. Um, also, they still have the only box that you can. It doesn't have numbers on it, but it's got a it's got a graduating wheel, and you can set it wherever you want there's there's no stops on it it's just cool and they're the only ones that have that which yeah you could tweak it a fraction of an inch yeah i like that and their their boxes also have a um a plastic fiber bar going across the front face of it instead of a brass bar okay and so they really work really well i, I actually, why why well, because the uh, the the car the heavy duty plastic bar is a lot more flexible than the brass bar, right? So I don't know. They they they're they're really nice to run. That makes sense. Plus, you get maybe microscopic wear on that plastic, the heavy well, duty get- plastic. You get a little wear to where it starts setting that mud just right. Especially if you could dial that. I assume yeah. it's not it's not a circle, right? It's like an oval. Yeah, it graduates up. Okay. Like the numbers, you know, on a box, you got one yeah. to four. This this uh dial is kind of offset a little bit to where when you turn it, it starts tightening it up. Cool. The, and the that's tape that's a tapeworm. So you yeah. did you Tapeworm. How did you find out about tapeworm to go and buy these tools when you're doing peace? And also, two part question: Was that a scary transition going from hourly to piece rate? Was piece rate kind of a thing at that time, or was piece rate sort of developing? Was it a new concept that these uh, owners of companies had to increase productivity? Well, I remember piecework back in Nebraska on the hanging part. All the hangers would hang, you know, yeah. piece rate. Okay. Um, we had 16-foot board up there, 14-foot board. You don't see any of that on the West Coast. 
No, um, they're too weak. They're, they're too they're too weak on the West Coast to handle those big boards. Yeah, and and up in the <laughs> and up in Nebraska, they glued everything too. You know, I mean, they did drive one screw or nail, but uh, to hold the sheet till it set. Um, but you, ah. it's a taper's dream to walk into one of those homes. But uh, how did the glue? The, how did the glue do? Real quick. Worked great. It's fine. They still glue everywhere. In fact, I've actually yeah. glued in, in Nevada, but I had to let the inspector know that I was gluing and had to have the empty cartridges so he could see them. Right. It's still uh, debatable. It's a debate in the yeah. drywall industry, but there is people using the butt boards, using glues yeah. with the butt yeah. boards, which I think is a very good system as well. Sorry, back to the story. But... Um, Anyway, I had my own tapeworm bazooka for two years, and I didn't know how to run it. So, <clears throat> I mean, I could run it on commercial work, which is a whole different ball game than than residential. You know, the up and down board is pretty simple to tape with, besides a house. And I told myself, I'm gonna learn how to do this. And so, I was doing apartments at that time for this company out of Stockton, California. They were in Tulsa doing some apartments for a builder that they did work for in California. So I went to work for them and they were all two guys, of course. And um, there was 146 units there. And the guy hired me just to run the gun uh, for 15 bucks a roll. I'll never forget it. 500 foot roll. And I didn't know shit. I mean, I, I knew the basics, but. I fought that thing and fought that thing and fought that thing. But I told myself, you know, by the time these 140 units are done, I'm going to yeah. know how to run this damn gun. Yeah. And I actually took a, you know, pretty much cut and pay just to learn. Oh, yeah. And I'll never forget, you know, it's kind of one of them turning points in life when you hit these certain little plateaus. And I'll never forget this guy from California that was on the job. And he goes, man, he goes, you'll fight that thing for three months. He goes, then one day it'll just all click and you'll never forget it. And you know what? He was exactly right. One day it just clicked. <laughs> yeah. Because there's, you know, there's 10 different things going on at the same time that you have to get habitually into your system to, in the right order to make it work. You're jamming it up constantly. Yeah. You're, oh, I tell you, I fought that thing and fought that thing, but I oh, yeah. clicked it. <laughs> interesting so what was your uh what was your i think i could put on six rolls if it was a fairly straightforward house that would be maybe the best i've ever done maybe i had help to do six rolls that seems like a lot what was your what was your pr what was your best the best i've ever done was in bellevue tennessee I'll never forget that job. It was an apartment <laughs> job. <laughs> yeah. It was another turning point. The uh, tape flowed like water. <laughs> oh, no. But uh, me and two other journeymen uh, and one helper, which was my ex-brother-in-law at the time, we did 420 units in, in a little over four months. Just us. Okay. And we would do... Um, we would do 10 coats a day, which what that meant was one coat on 10 units. Um, but they were all on the same side because you had two breezeways with 10 units, 20 unit building. Beautiful. So we would make sure that one breezeway was completely hung before we even went there and started taping. And there was like 73 sheets in each unit. So that's what, 730 sheets in a day for three of us. It was a little over 21 rolls of tape. But uh, we actually got that job down to a science. I mean, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You knew every move to make and win. And if you if you got out of your sink, you just cost yourself a day. You right. Know, something was to happen. So That was probably fun, though, as a, as a drywall finisher, though, squeezing that efficiency. That's kind of what we live for. Yeah, that was in the mid '80s. I went down there and did that for some guys out of Tulsa, actually. But uh, yeah, it was that was the best I've ever done, and and as far as you know, production. But I had help. Okay. It wasn't just me. Me, nah. You know, you're right. Five, six. That's a, that's that's a good day. 
how a guy, oh, I could, you know, I was in Vegas and these guys could, you know, throw on a roll of tape in 10 minutes. Well, finally one day it was funny. This one guy goes, well, yeah, I could do that too. Just roll it down the street. <laughs> you know, it, it's yeah. pretty crazy. Some of the stories we hear of these guys. Yeah, especially on social media, you know. I, oh, I love the, I love the bash or somebody be like, oh, I, I did really good. I hung this job and it looks really good. And somebody's like, I can do that. I can do that in an afternoon. It's easy to be mean on social media. <laughs> it's it's funny how things change too, because like when I came up in Nebraska starting out, um, they would use all the different size boards. Uh, the, the drywall guy would measure the house and he'd go, okay, two eight foots here, one ten foot here. 14 foot here and you wouldn't have a whole lot of scrap but the hangers was all nails then there was no screws back in the 70s and the hangers would nail off around the doors but they would put them like maybe a quarter of an inch away from the edge and then when they hit the dent part they would put a diagonal on it right on the edge of the rock so you didn't even have to spot the nails around the doors that was just not happening okay but nowadays you don't see any of that kind of stuff going on you know, the nails are just wherever they can find to put them. Yeah. But um, it, it was kind of cool back to see stuff like that. Once and they're predominantly while, screws, right? Now it is, but not then. It was all nail, not ring then. shank yeah. nails. Yeah. Yeah. And glue. But it's uh, kind of it, fun to, it's kind of fun to watch those old school dudes with putting up nails with. <laughs> a lot of work man it's comical <laughs> it's comical but it's fun to watch like those guys are so good man you know yeah we used to have guys they were working for five cents a foot in nebraska i'll never forget it and yeah you know most white guys can't work together uh they're divorced by lunch so the white yeah. guys would they, they would lit each other's houses out and then they'd wall them out themselves yeah they would just trade off, you know, but they would all drive Corvettes at five cents a foot. You know, it's just like, wow, what the hell? These guys are, you know, pretty good. Yeah. But back then, back then, uh, you know, 50, 55 sheets a day was the average for these guys, you know, that to put up themselves. And right. today you're lucky to get 10, you know? Right. <laughs> um, Back to Tulsa, you start uh -huh. doing piece rate. You're running that damn tapeworm. Where do we go from here? Well, piece works a whole different ball game than hourly. I had to right. learn that. Right. Um, you're getting paid obviously for what you're doing, so you have <laughs> yeah. to learn the different yeah. tricks. Maybe we stop pre-filling. Maybe we just tape out the damn house before we pre-fill and just hope for the best, right? So why the fuck am I walking around pre-filling, yeah. you know, if I'm like, it's costing me money. That's a different mindset. Yeah. You know, people are always like, oh, I pre-fill everything. It's like, okay, well, there's a difference between charging enough. Of course, when you run your own business, that's a thing. But I always like, I always look to pre-fill because, uh, I mean, if it's a bad blowout, yeah, cut it out and tape it. But like, I'm not going around spending a half a day dog dicking around with quick no. set and pre fill. Not when I'm making like uh, Sierra Vista, I was making eight cents. Yeah. Ain't yeah. pre filling with no eight cents, dude. You don't get pre fill <laughs> this guy for eight cents. Well, pre fill also, um, like in Nebraska, I started out, we used round nose board up there. And they still make it, but you don't see it too much. And you have to pre-fill that on the joints. Okay. Uh, we did that with 90 minute, and then we taped the house. But then we would also turn around and box it out, which you can do because you pre-filled. When I went okay. down to Tulsa and doing commercial, I'd never seen square nose board and no pre-fill. I'm like, what the hell is this, you know? Right. But you get used to it. It's just a little different thing, but. Yeah, there's a there's a difference there. You get piece rate under your belt. Under your belt, the next logical step is to you start thinking. Well, if I'm doing this, I could probably run my own gig. Well, not at that time. Um, okay. In Oklahoma, uh, work is kind of seasonal. Okay. Winter winter time usually is is kind of slow. Um. So anyway, um, the guys I was working for in the apartments there were from Stockton, and we got along really well. And so 
when I got done with the Tennessee thing, um, they invited me out to Stockton. So that's kind of how I got on the West Coast here. There you go. Um, all my family is from Fresno, and they all pretty much still live there. So I was pretty familiar with Central California, but okay, I had never lived there. Okay. So I went out there, and about three weeks into it, uh, I had a, uh, a wife and two small children at that time. Well, no, not at that time. Close to it. Yeah. Um, the guy I was working for says, well, we're going to make you a spray guy. Well, yeah. I'd sprayed with a hopper before and stuff like that, but I had never sprayed with a machine. Okay. And these yeah. guys are like mass production, you know? Yeah. You're talking orange peel, right? No, we're talking knockdown. Knockdown? Okay. The orange peel was a little bit later on, but... <clears throat> okay. So they had this big old spray king, 350, a new machine. Like, that's a... You tow on the back of your truck. Okay. Has the paddles and everything. So he goes, I'll meet you out on the job, and I'm going to teach you how to spray. And I'm like, man, okay, whatever, you know. I Good luck. Good luck, pal. I'm a drywaller, and you can't teach me shit. <laughs> oh, God. Well, I've always been kind of open to learn. That's good. So, That's good. Um, it was all piecework. Even when I was learning how to spray, they didn't pay me by the hour to learn. Okay. They would pay me by the hour to do repairs, but not whether it was drywall or repair the machine. Okay. But spraying was piece. Okay. And I had to learn that basically yeah. on my own. He showed me for, I thought he was going to work with me for a week or something. So we showed up at the house on Saturday and he goes, okay, mask this off. And I already knew how to mask off pretty, pretty okay. Yeah. So he goes, uh, go ahead and get mixed up. So I did that. And man, I froze the paddles up because it was too thick and on and on. I mean, I was fighting it. He's like, okay, come in and spray the garage. It was going to go an orange peel because in California, garages and closets, they don't knock them down. Okay. Um, just to save time. Yeah. So he goes, okay, spray this garage. So I did that. And he goes, ah, it looks good. I'll see you later, man. That was that was it for my training. And I'm like, holy shit, you know. So I fought that for about two months. And I'll never forget. I mean, it was taking me and my ex-wife all day long just to do a little, you know, track shack, 120 sheets in Central California. We were yeah. working ass off. It could be why she's your ex-wife. Yeah, yeah, it could be. So... <laughs> Anyway, I'll never forget the day I went in the office. You know, this is another turning point in life. And he goes, oh, yeah. I'm gonna give you I'm gonna give you two houses today. And I looked at him, I go, dude, you're fucking nuts. He goes, you know what? He goes, most spray guys with a helper can do four or five a day. And I'm like, oh, you're you're nuts. So yeah. I went out there and uh he didn't give me any pointers or anything, and we just made it happen. We but it was another turning point that okay now i can get this done you know so you learn these different systems yeah yeah and different ways of doing things to get your quality plus get your production out there yeah the best i ever sprayed was here in rio nevada i did seven houses in one day with one helper but Jesus. they were two of them were knocked down the rest were orange peel so it was pretty easy <laughs> that's pretty I, damn good yeah, so that was back in the, I don't know, early 2000s, maybe. What's a, what's a day like that yield at piece rate spraying? Uh, I was getting a sit and three-quarter foot at that time, uh, no prep coat, just spray. Yeah. Um, I would have one person the day before, because I worked for some pretty good-sized companies here in Reno, um, I basically learned how to spray in California, but it didn't really pay off till I got to Reno, Nevada. Okay. Um, I would have a person the day before that's just a master, and they would go out and get at least one or two masked off the prior day before. Okay. Um, to, to, and I was always mixed up the night before with a full tank, so I'm yeah. ready to go the first day. Yeah, night. okay. Because little things like that cost you big, you know, that'll cost yeah. you at the end of the day. 
I do the same with Fresco. If I'm on a big Fresco job, I'll prep everything the day before because I'm also very system orient oriented, even with Fresco yeah. Harmony. You can really produce with that shit too. Oh, if you're yeah. if you're good and I'm making a healthy square footage price. It's just yeah. mud. It's just texture. Yeah. <laughs> really yeah. you're just getting a premium like like that production thing that you're talking about is i see it with fresco harmony also like whole mm -hmm. houses with the sand there's no reason why you couldn't blow out whole houses and get that shit going three guys couple of days and i mean yeah. you're cranking and making houses look like venetian plaster and making oh, yeah. a pre and making a premium. Oh, absolutely. And we're not there yet, but that's what I see. I see yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's 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 coming down the road. It's coming. Yeah, yeah. There's dudes here in Albuquerque that sprayed out a whole house with a uh, Merriman beige base coat uh just to cover the butts and bands in a half a day. 5,000 square foot custom home. And then the next day all sanded so you're not you're not doing the two coat normal system. The sand sits on top, and then you're you're and then it took them probably nine days, I think. Three guys, five thousand square foot house. They trialed on the last coat, spray the on the base coat, trial on the last coat. They trialed on the sand finish with the Merriman beige. Okay. So that sits on top of your orange peel, your light. It's almost like a mist, almost like a fog. Mm -hmm. uh, with the Merriman beige just to cover your butts and bands, put a preliminary coat on your wall, and then you go over it with the sanded finish. Okay. And then they were letting that dry, trowel it out as smooth as you can, let it dry. Mm -hmm. They could brush it even a little bit with a sanding pole and then do your trowel sealer. So what they, they used to spray it with the sand in it. I have a video. I have a video that I'll uh, I'll I'll cut in uh, during this part of the interview so that our people can watch it on YouTube. But uh, I asked the guy. Uh, it was Elite Drywall here, but they have a and I could I could you know get you that information too. But yeah, you could do whole houses like nobody's we, business. We tried that once in Oklahoma. It wasn't with Fresco, but we were doing right. some exterior. Uh, thorough seal on some dormitory buildings. Okay, and we were we're drywallers, so we thought, yeah, we'll just mix this stuff up, and throw it to the the spray force we had out there, you know, three fifty <laughs> gallon. Yeah, so we got it all mixed up. We got the hose dragged up there. We're like, man, we're gonna, you know, just cut a fat hog in the ass here, you know. Sure. So we hit the trigger, right? We're ready to spray up, and we watched the hose, you know, down at the machine down below us, and. It lasted all of about three seconds and locked up, you know, just dry pack everywhere. Ouch. We had to wind up actually throwing about 200 feet of hose away Ooh. because it was just locked up. So we learned our lesson on uh, yeah. standard tubes, a little hard to be pumping uh, sand. Right. <laughs> but that's that base coat doesn't have any sand in it. Okay. So you can use really anything. Just mud. So they're they're putting they're putting uh, uh, fresco colored into like say a Graco five thousand or or whatever. I, just... I, I've never done it. I told, but I told them they could do it. <laughs> <laughs> I went into one of the because the, they were using the sand, and I was like, oh, this could be, this could get quicker. We did a job where I tried to just do sand over level three. Mm -hmm. One coat and then seal. It almost worked. You could still see the butt and the band a little bit. And I was like, oh, man. Well, and then I was thinking you could just go in and spray texture out a house and then go over that with the sand because that would that would kill all your butts and bands, mm -hmm. you know, preliminary coat. And then it was like, well, you could put the color in the and texture out a house the same way. Mm -hmm. And so these guys were uh, running base coat on everything by hand. And I went into a room and I was talking to the lead guy and I was like, try spraying out this room. This is a parade of homes house. Norm mm -hmm. Schreifel's <laughs> Sun Mountain Construction featured parade of homes house. Like oh, boy. beautiful home, 
like, you know, everything to the nines. And I was like, just spray out this room and then finish it and see how it goes. I came back the next day. They sprayed out the whole house <laughs> and, like, and then finished it. And yeah. everyone loved it. Everybody well, loved it. It looked gorgeous, like 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 a high end finish, you know. Yeah. Um, it was beautiful. Well, a, lot of the, a lot of the problem we run into is seeing the joints and the butts is these guys, you know, grinding the hell out of these houses, you know, when they tape them, which I yeah. learned in the 70s and 80s, you, you finish to avoid sanding, you know, touch it up instead of grinding it. Because yeah. a lot of time, a lot of times these guys are doing more damage than what they're trying to cure. I mean, it's it's, you know. Yeah, especially if you don't know or you have apprentices that are sanding, which is, can be in a very important job. If you oh, don't, yeah. if you're not knowledgeable about how the finish needs to be, you're not going to be knowledgeable about how the sanding needs to be. It's real easy to throw an apprentice onto sanding, and it's like they'll just tear up a room. Oh yeah. So I mean, an an, an edge can only get so flat, and, and beyond that, you're just grinding the paper. <laughs> right, right. You know. We've got some. We still have some time, and I've I've cut you off a little bit. You're over in California. You're still in Reno, but you, um, and the, the fresco conversations kind of you know that that's an interesting conversation. But you are an early adapter of fresco harmony. You've been doing several projects for a long time because I remember when your name first popped up because it was like oh Walter Baker the pretzel maker. <laughs> <laughs> hey we got a, we got walter baker uh when was your first uh fresco job that was a while ago right it was actually i saw your stuff come across facebook i think it was or some multimedia and i'm like wow that's a hell of an idea and i have always been into colored mud um you see colored mud and topping like in Hamilton's yeah. mm -hmm. and there's a reason for that. And guys don't really understand it, but I learned the value of colored mud on jobs such as when you get into some of these commercial jobs or residential where they have a lot of repairs um, and you've got five or six guys that you're working with. Um, sometimes these repairs are some pretty nasty butt joints on some of these walls that they leave behind and they want you to putty coat them out and then fix the bad butt. You know what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Well, it's easier to put some blue in your mud and just for that butt joint or if sure. there's, you know, 10 of them on the job in different areas or big patches, color them out. That way the next guy that comes in, you go, dude, hit everything that's blue. And he goes right to it. He sees the parameters. He knows exactly where it's at. If Smart. you have white walls with white mud, the guy's going to waste all his time searching for shit. Smart. So on jobs where there's lots of different stuff going on, colored mud is the way to go. Also, yeah. when I had my company, we did one job where I had oh, five or six guys, and each one of them had their own color so I could see what they did for the day. Smart. You know, I what mean, were you using to color to tint the patch mud? That was just basically a paint tint you buy at Sherwin Williams or whatever. Okay. All right. Um, gravy. But back in the 2000s, I took a little class uh, at uh, Calply here. I don't think they're okay. called Calply anymore. They got bought out. But at FBM, we had a Calply here. Yeah. Uh, L and W bottom out. That's right. Yeah, we have L and W here too. But yeah, they were giving out some free classes on a the stuff that you see that guy in Miami doing all the time on Facebook. You know, the walls have to be level five, and and you're putting on this little thin coat stuff with this little miniature trowel that doesn't hold yeah. a teaspoon of mud. And those trowels are adorable. Yeah, so I, I kind of <laughs> took that class, and I've always been interested in it. And there sure, was couple, there was a couple of drywall companies that picked it up here, and they were getting like twenty five bucks a square foot to put this crap on. Oh, and sure. I'm looking at this, and I mean, it looked good, like for people's wine cellars and stuff, you know. And 
it always looked really good, but I'm like, wow, that's, you know, two or three coats with a little miniature. I'm not even interested in that. It looks good, but, you know. So I've always been kind of interested in it, but then I seen your stuff and I'm like, oh, okay, drywall mud and yeah, this could work, you know, uh, two coats. All I need is uh, tape and top and I'm ready to go. Right. I don't need to get this stuff to level five with a damn light, you know? No. And um, yeah, so it was like a no brainer, you know? Okay. Cool. Interesting. You, you, you were curious, your, your interest had been piqued, but just for whatever reason, you didn't like the, the, you just didn't like the Venetian plaster stuff. You were like, eh, you didn't want to try it. Too much work. Too much work. Yeah. <laughs> well, people that do it say it's a lot of work. Um, too much work with a little trial. I was just, nah. Why yeah. the little fucking trowel? I still can't wrap my brain. Can't you put that shit on with a bigger trowel? You would think. <laughs> These guys obviously aren't production. <laughs> yeah, you know. They... <laughs> and the other thing, too, is their systems are like so high dollar, you know? And It's just like um, coat after coat. Oh, we're going to do eight coats on this. It's like, yeah. Okay. Okay. And then I came across the house, I don't know, eight, nine, ten years ago, maybe out here in Reno, out in the desert. And it was an Adobe house, and this guy was in the middle of American clay. And his guy had bailed on him for whatever reason. I don't know. And he asked me, he goes, you know, do you know how to do American clay? And I I'm a taper, obviously. I could learn, but I had never even really heard of it. So I researched into it, and okay. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to kind of shy away from this. But I still had interest in that type of stuff because, you know, it really looks nice. Did you um, did you do a little American clay? No, I've never done it. You haven't done it? I've never. I had another guy that used the, um, in fact, I think I talked to you about it a few years back. He had some Venetia. It's called Venetian something. It's out of Albuquerque, too. Um, Variants. Variants, probably. Variants. There you go. He had a doctor's house, and he had a guy that had done it, and and he had a couple more rooms he wanted to do, and and, uh, the guy had moved off to California somewhere. That's kind of the problem with these higher-end systems, which I ran into that here a year or two back, where the American clay guy had split. He's in Indiana, and this right. this lady's got water damage, and you don't know what they did. You right. Know, I mean, I, you and I were like trying to match this up forever, and think I think I sent you some pictures of it, uh, and we finally got it to where she liked it. Um, but yeah. So you, I think, in that instance, you ordered a custom color, which is what we do. Sent you we did maybe we, you sent you sent me maybe a little swatch of the. Pro- sometimes in a situation people have sent me like a piece of the wall and I can match that too to a fresco and harmony we, color we did that but we also had Reno Paint Mart uh, color match it with a code and I think we sent you that plus the code and then you, there you deciphered go. it Yeah, um, but we wound up not even using that she wound up using just a half a bottle per box of the oh funny the dark, darker earth tone that you have. I can't think of the name of it. Um, maybe Mellow Umber, maybe? No, it was darker than that. It's the... Uh, Spalding Espresso? Yeah, yeah, half a bottle of Spalding Espresso. That was the ticket right there. That's funny. You know what's weird about that? Some people are using like half a bottle, but like, did you... Like if if I was somebody and I was going to use half a bottle, I don't suggest doing that because you get color drift because a certain amount sticks to the bottom of the bottle, I would get all of it out into another container, fill mm-hmm. up a container with water and mix it really good and make sure you have all the color out of that bottle. Then you could use half, but you're still yeah, going to get cut. Yeah. So that it was, it was a little drifty on that one, but I mean, as long as you're going corner to corner, you were probably okay. Yeah. Yeah. I went corner to corner on that. There was a couple of walls that she had that were American clay where there were repairs like right in the middle of it. But um, she had a girl that didn't really do these systems, but she was like a painter 
artist type thing. Um, so she had her come in just to kind of match in these little small areas. Oh, okay. Because, uh, you know, you do one repair, you got to go corner to corner pretty much. Kind of. Um, but so she pulled it off. I didn't want to mess with that because now you're, yeah. you're opening up more cans of worms. and Yeah, know. or just I, my sales point on that one is like go corner to corner, and then at least I know that I can get that color in the future if you have any more issues moving yeah. forward. Yeah. You know, but the, uh, I have a job right now that's Galtier of Steel that I did patching on that it turned out light. The color's lighter, so I have to... You know, and the client's like, yeah. hey, it doesn't match. It's like, well, you still, there were dog scratches. A dog scratched up the wall, like in like eight places. You know, I just went hourly. It took me three hours. I went through Gallery Pearl and Galtiero Steel. The patches are gone. Yeah. You know, like you ain't going to hire a painter to come in for 300 bucks. You know what I mean? Yeah. Let alone a drywall guy. So now I'm like, okay, I got a charger. You know, it's like, I don't want to, but it's like, I can skim out your wall and make it go away, but I got to charge you. I can't work for free. That's always a tough conversation, right? Yeah. People have in their minds what something's worth, even though they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> yeah. It's like, okay, well, it's going to cost you another 200 bucks. You know, yeah. there are, they were already, you know, getting their panties in a bunch about 300 bucks, which is nothing for a drywall patch. But I'm like, yeah. it's gonna, you know, it's going to cost you another 200 bucks for me to skim these walls. Good luck having a painter come in to just paint two walls for 200 bucks. It ain't yeah. happening, you know? <laughs> so sometimes for us drywallers, it's hard to realize our value. You know, it's like, fuck you, dude. You know, I can't work for free. Well, yeah, it's yeah. I, this one job I'm doing right now, actually, I got to go put the sealer on it later today. Um these people wanted a lime wash mm -hmm. and the husband's an engineer and he had went into their, the toilet room, let's call it just where the toilet is mm -hmm. newer home track house, Lennar, you know, and he had taken like some Portland, I think. Beautiful. And mixed it up. And now I have seen that. Don't get me wrong. Sure. But it does, does look good. Yeah. Um, but he had taken Portland and went over his orange peel, didn't know what he was doing. He sanded it down, had dust everywhere. The wife was bitching. And <laughs> he he couldn't he couldn't get rid of when he grunt when he sanded it down, the orange peel peaks kept popping through. He couldn't figure uh, out how to get past all that. Oh funny. So she was talking about a lime wash when I went and looked at the job and I I looked at her and I go, you know what? I think I have something for you. So we went to your website. I go, choose okay. your colors here. <laughs> I go, I have to get your walls flat anyway. So if you're going to lime wash it, so let's just get color in there and get it done. Right. And that was a selling point there. So I'm just doing their their little toilet room plus the main bathroom area. Yeah, they'll love it. Now, are you using the sand? And have you used the sand before? Because that would give them their sort of micro cement or concrete look that maybe they're going for. I don't know. I am. Um, I have used sand on probably the last two or three jobs I've done. Uh, because I, li I like the look. It's cool, huh? It's like yeah. a nice, it's a nice, like traditional plaster look. Yeah. But yeah, I, I have used the sand on the last couple of jobs. Okay. Yeah, I, right. I do some little I do some little ceilings for my my stepdaughter up in South Lake Tahoe. Okay. Um, they they always got something going on and I'll have some left over, you know, a bucket full or something. Yeah. You only need a pan full for something and you're done yeah. and now you got this yeah. left over. So I'll go up there and give it yeah. to them basically and do it that's with any thing. product that's with any product though. i get people like oh you got to mix up a whole bucket if you want to do a small amount it's like yeah but if i was buying product from variants or whoever american clay i'm gonna have to buy a 200 bag dollar bag of that crap you know to mix yeah. up a small amount to do a patch at least you know it's 30 bucks or 40 bucks or what it's not like, you know, it's not yeah. crazy. And you know, that color is going to be perfect 
which is nice. Yeah, I don't, I don't get too upset, you know, throwing a half a bucket out or something if I have to. I mean, it, right. it's not, it, it's, it's. I feel worse about getting rid of the bucket itself than I do the mud. <laughs> yeah, and I keep it. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll scoop them out into a box and clean my buckets. I mean, I'm weird yeah. like that. You know, I keep my buckets. Um, I'll keep the mud for long periods of time. I try to use clean water, and that colored mud will stay for a long time. You know, if if I need to make a sample, I'll mark the top of the bucket yeah. or I'll keep like a small amount, like a little Tupperware or uh, like one of my old gal- uh, gallon size sealer tubs. Yeah. Like I'll just keep like a little bit of the mud and then toss the rest, you know. Yeah. yeah Those are nice. Out. Those are nice for patching too. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. Didn't you say Very you were cool. up in? Didn't you say you were up in Colorado for a while? I think I was yeah. reading that on your bio or something. Yeah, yeah, Red I was Colorado. in uh, Crested Butte, Colorado. Oh my God, I I grew up in Boulder actually. Oh really? They're doing fresco over there, man. Out west drywall supply. We call it the gold, the gold belt. You got Vale, Aspen. <laughs> Uh, Grand Junction over to Montrose. Uh, those guys are, they're selling. Tell your ride. Yeah. Tell your ride's a little on the far side, but we've got the dudes in Montrose. Yeah. They take care of all that tell your ride stuff. Those guys in Colorado, they do a lot of driving. Oh yeah. Yeah. They're not, they're not shy to drive a hundred, uh, you know, an hour and a half one way for a job, which That's is a crazy. lot. Yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> It's pretty crazy. Very cool. So now you run your own business, American Acoustics. How long have you been doing that? Do you have real quick, do you have any like pointers or uh, advice you could offer people looking to start their own business or run their own business? It's not easy. Yeah. Um, Back in the 2000s, I had Baker Drywall, and uh, we were, I peaked out at 96 guys. Um, I That's don't a miss couple. It. Yeah. yeah, I don't miss it. I had two secretaries, full-time estimator, and it was a full-time babysitting job. Sure. It turned into a full-time job of just collecting money and trying to save the bleeding. Um, because everybody's going to make you bleed, whether it's your employees, your builders. Ugh, yeah. And so you need to keep that. You're never going to stop it, but you just have to keep it. I don't miss those days at all. Okay. Um, if you had your druthers, what would the perfect drywall company look like? That's pretty cool because you've then I'm you had to build your way up to that many yeah. employees. So you've ran a small company where it's just you, maybe one employee, all the way up to ninety some employees. If you had your druthers, what would the perfect drywall company look like? I made the best money when I was at Baker Drywall with about fifteen guys. You know, two okay. crews of hangers. Uh, two or three crews of tapers. I could control them. Yep. I had low overhead. Um, yep. I did all my own spraying, so I was the quality check guy at the end. Yep. Um, and I made good money doing that. Yeah. Um, I went from 20 guys to, say, 40 guys, and in my mind, I was thinking, oh, gee. Double profit. Nice money. Well, yeah. What you don't realize is now you need supervisors. Now you need more trucks. Now your supervisors, they want retirement. They want health insurance. Then your secretary wants the same thing they're getting. Yeah. Including the salary they're getting. Yeah. It's just like an adult daycare. Um, So I would say the sweet spot is something that you can still control yourself. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, In drywall... You got to have your thumb on, you got to have your thumb on there because also quality control too, because yep. at, at now at 40 guys, you're losing a lot of quality. Yep. You, I had, I had four full-time patch guys at one time. Ugh. A lot I'd of it that. was. I'd love that job. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of it was, you know, extras. I mean, I got paid for it, but a lot of it was just fixing the fuck ups, you know? Yeah. And uh, guys just don't give a shit, you know? Um, right. It's and the builder's like, I thought that was included. Come on, we don't get a round, we don't get a couple rounds of patches. 
Oh, yeah, yeah, there's always those builders, but then you always have your really good ones, too, which are far and few between. Yeah. But uh, I used to do a lot of track homes in Fernley, Nevada, out here uh, east of Reno, because none of the drywallers in Reno wanted to go out there. And I'm like, fuck it, I'll go to Fernley. Yeah. And I did about 90% of Fernley back in the 2000s, which was a lot of tracks. Okay. And uh, had really good builders out there. I had nothing in writing, which I wouldn't advise, but these were just good old boys. And you know yeah. what? I never lost one dime. There ever. you go. Yeah. And I had one builder out there. It was a good old boy. He told me, he goes, I was, I was going to start doing some homes here in Reno. And I, I was complaining to him, you know, I got to do the lien releases, got to do the contracts. And he looked at me and he goes, Walter, he goes, the day you have to sign a contract is the day you'll never have enough money in that contract to get the money out of it. And boy, was he right. Yeah. <laughs> That's a per yeah. that's a, I was gonna ask you for a pearl of wisdom, but that is probably as good as it gets. Uh can you say that again for uh just in case anybody <laughs> missed it? Well, the spiller told me when I was And and also tell me what that means to you. Well, it's I used to do a lot of work with nothing in writing, and like I said, I never lost a dime. Uh, we're talking hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars. Yeah. And it got to the point where I was doing tracks for these regular builders and they wanted everything in writing. And I was complaining to this one builder because I didn't, I was new to lean releases and this and that. Yeah. And he told me, he says, Walter, he goes, the day that you have to sign a contract is the day there will never be enough money in that contract to get the money out of that contract. In other words, you're going to get screwed in the end. Right. And he was so correct. <laughs> what did you take what did you do with that advice well i always kept it in the back of my mind but again um these guys in fernley were mainly local guys even though some of them were doing 1200 house tracks out there they were mainly local guys and they they were just getting to the point where they could attract in the toll brothers lenars the pulties Okay. And sell out. Yeah. Most of them, most of them sold out two years before it crashed and took their money, which okay. was smart. Yeah. Um. So when these guys start taking over, of course they want everything in writing. You know. Um. I mean, it does have its advantages. Don't get me wrong, but again, yeah, of course, the the good days were over at that point. <laughs> no doubt. Yeah. Um, is there a tool or system? You're an older person in the trade. You've been around. Is there a tool or a system that you thought would absolutely not work or you were resistant to it for the longest time? And then for whatever reason, you tried it and it changed the way that you do your work. And now you wouldn't do your job without it. What would it be? When I was in Tulsa, um, Ames, of course, it just well, it was a couple of years after you had the tapeworms out. Yeah. Well, then you then you had the premieres come out, which is actually Blue Line now. Right. And Blue Line had wheels on her nail spotter. Yeah. And I was doing those apartments in Tulsa, and this one friend of mine had come on the job, and he had this blue nail spotter. I liked the color, you know. I was like, whoa, you know. Yeah. And I thought that's the silliest shit. These damn wheels on a nail spotter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So he looked at me and he goes, okay, try it. Because I'm used to the skid plate, you know, the aims or the, you know. Yeah. He goes, try it. He goes, the first row of nails you do, because it was just nails then. He goes, you're going to like it. He goes, the second row you do, you're going to love it. And third row you do, you're going to go get your own. And he was right. I still have <laughs> blue line nail spotters. That's all I use for nail spotters. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> well, That's we a thought given. that was the silliest shit in the world, you know. Yeah, you're wow, like, hey, get it, get off my job, get off my job with those yeah. wheels. <laughs> That's great, Walter yeah. Baker, 63 years young, out of Reno, Nevada, American Acoustics. Thank you for being on the Drywall Podcast. This was cool, right? It was. It was. It was. One piece of advice I'd like to give everybody, though, is I've learned over the years. Yeah. 
do something the next guy won't. Um, I don't have a college education, but I have lived the dream. I have put my children through college. Uh, some of them, not all of them. Yeah. Uh, drywall has paid off. But you got to have the right attitude, and you got to be willing to do what the next guy is not. I like it. Um, even if you're on a job, you know, in the union or hourly or whatever, I don't. I'm not saying you need to kiss everybody's ass, but the golden rule in life is he who has the tools rules. Well, he who has the tools rules, and the tools okay. can be fine. The tools can be in your truck, uh, your knowledge. Always be willing to learn something. Uh... In uh in the recovery movement, they do they call it a toolbox. You know, you oh, keep, okay. Keep your stuff in your toolbox. You know, yeah. the good the good stuff that sometimes you need to get into that toolbox, pull out uh pull out those useful tools from time yeah. to time. A lot yeah. of times, guys, you go to work for through your life. Um, a lot of times, first impressions are everything, and if you show up on a job with a wooden sanding pole, pan and a knife, you know, six, you know, 10, 12, eight, whatever. And a couple of buckets and a brush and a, a sponge, even though say in the union, that's really all they require. And you got another guy that comes in with, you know, smoothing knife, uh, got an assortment of stuff and he's got an extendable pole sander. Who are you going to hire? The guy without the tools, that's going to be his attitude while he's working for you. He's not going to put out much at all. Very rarely. Now, I'm not saying there are some exceptions. Sure. But, but you can always pretty much judge somebody and what they're going to do by the tools they bring on the job. Interesting. Yeah. Or there's their knowledge level too. Yeah. I mean, we're we're getting into a day and age when being picky about help is challenging. Because there ain't much out there. Well, you know, that's really where this trade is lacking is training. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it that all kind of started in the 80s with piecework. Piecework is great. Um, it protects the contractor. He knows what he's paying. It protects the guy. If he's any good, he can make good money. It's, it's a good system. Yeah. But the problem we ran into is training where um, – guys with one or two years experience now all of a sudden they have a crew and now they're teaching the next guy that one mm -hmm. or two years of experience and it just snowballs from there you don't get guys anymore really with four and five years of some serious accountable training yeah um, that know what they're doing they get one or two years in they catch a glimpse of their bosses check one day and they're like oh i can do that and goes off and gets his own crew and yeah. piecework allows for that. Now you got guys that won't even do a house unless they got a a grind and sander, you know, with the vacuum clear, if you're yeah. working with vacuum clear. <laughs> yeah. And it's just like, are you kidding me, you know? But yeah, yeah that's that's kind of where that's at. We need to up the training bad in this profession. Sure, sure. Well, you've brought, you've certainly brought a wealth of knowledge to the drywall podcast. Um, it's great to finally, it. you know, we've communicated and you've been buying product for a long time. So we've known each other for a long time, but how great is it to get to sit and talk for an hour? Man? Right. It's wonderful. It's, yeah, it's cool. <laughs> I didn't realize you were, uh, so rounded, so well-rounded as a, as a drywall finisher. You've got a lot of good experience. I've got. I've got every tool. Yeah. I'm a tool addict. <laughs> Literally, I am. If I see something like, you know, the guy you had on here a while back with that little sponge for the corner. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm looking at that. <laughs> I, I've never even used it yet. It's still sitting here at my house. But I'm like, you know what? I like that. It's I was in like my garage. cleaning bullnose. Like just, just to yeah. pull it on the job to clean off the bullnose. Save Scream. time. And then, uh, <laughs> like, I have oddity tools. Like, I have an angle head, uh, two angle heads. I have one angle head that would do that will do a uh, Cove 135s instead of the paddle knife. They'd made an angle head uh, for, that okay. for like two years. And okay. uh, I've never, I've never even used the thing, but I've also got a tape tech angle head that's made just for mesh tape when mesh tape was big back in the cool. 2000s. 
Yeah. That, that won't rip the mesh tape. Okay. Um, just yeah, I'm a I'm a tool addict. That's my that favorite. tool would probably work good for fibrofuse. I know people struggle with fibrofuse yes. in the in the angles, the ripping. Mm -hmm. I'll bet you that I'll bet you that tool would work great for fibrofuse. Yeah, it's got a plastic body on it, so it doesn't, uh, and it's got the blade set just a little bit different. Okay. Um, but yeah, I I got all I got every tool and taping you can imagine. It's just yeah. 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 <laughs> if it, if it's new and I like it, I'm getting it. I appreciate your time. Uh, and yeah, to shoot, man. Well, is, I mean, we just got like, like sort of the tip of the iceberg of right. Walter Baker. You're, I mean, you've like got so much experience that we didn't get into a lot of it, but you did share a good fair amount. Well, maybe we'll get back together again sometime. Yeah. We'll have to have a part two. All right, hey. buddy. <laughs> you uh you have a good rest of your day and we'll talk soon all right all right thank you appreciate it thank you so much you bet walter thank uh -huh. you you bet a huge shout out to mr baker of american acoustics for being with us on the drywall podcast today what a pleasure what a huge amount of knowledge you have maybe there's some room for a part two but i just want you to know that i appreciate you and what you bring to the trade the drywall podcast can be listened to on your favorite platforms such as but not limited to podbean apple Podcasts, spotify and if you are wanting to watch the podcast you can do so over at youtube but if you go over there be sure to subscribe to our page i would appreciate it and it's awesome guests of the drywall podcast like walter baker will receive a sweet swag bucket from our friends at csr full of cool drywall things uh such as Maybe an air freshener that says CSR on it and smells really good. Maybe you will get a shirt. Maybe a three-way or a tech dry tool. There could be a Fresco Harmony sample pack nestled in there as well. Thank you so much for joining the Drywall Podcast today. I sincerely appreciate it. I'm not just saying that I do each and every episode I hope you all have an amazing weekend. And remember, just keep drywalling. <laughs>